Troublesome vibrations, which can originate from many different sources in an automobile, are sometimes hard to diagnose and eliminate. In this program, we'll look at some time-saving procedures you can use to isolate and eliminate various sources of vehicle vibrations. If you've ever spent an entire day trying to find a vibration source, I think you'll appreciate the information contained in this program. First, we'll discuss the crucial role of the service advisor in isolating vibration sources. Then, we'll run through a few tests that can help you determine just what's causing your particular vibration problem. Finally, we'll cover some specific inspection procedures for the areas most often responsible for vibration problems. These areas are wheel and tires, exhaust system components, drive line components, and engine belt-driven components. You know, the average customer doesn't know exactly what's causing his vibration problem, but he can provide some helpful information if the service advisor asks the right questions. Jan, do you hear any noise when the vibration occurs? No, I don't notice any noise, but I sure can feel a shaking through the floor and seat. Do you have any idea as to where the vibration seems to be coming from? Yes, I'd say somewhere toward the back of the car. Does the vibration become more noticeable when you accelerate? Now that you mention it, the problem becomes more severe when I pull away from a stoplight or pass another car. Say, I hope these notes I've made will help you take care of the lady's problem. Jim, if you can spare a couple of minutes, could you give our friends here any tips on the kinds of questions to ask customers who report vibration problems? Sure. First off, find out if the customer can hear the vibration. Then try to find out where he thinks the vibration is coming from. Also, when and where is the vibration the most noticeable? Is it felt mostly through the steering wheel or the seat? Does it become severe during acceleration? And don't forget about loading conditions. If the vibration is most noticeable when the vehicle is loaded, this can also provide some clues for you guys. Always look for obvious causes of the problem. Maybe the customer has had a flat tire recently and forgot to tighten all of the lug nuts. Or maybe he's had his exhaust system serviced lately and part of the system was incorrectly installed. And Mike, I always go for a road test with a customer at the wheel. This ensures that I know exactly what vibration the customer is referring to. It also gives me the opportunity to observe for myself the conditions under which the problem is most noticeable. Thanks for the tips, Jim. I'll tell you, your efforts up front have saved me plenty of trial and error time on vibration jobs. After Jim has passed his findings on to me, I always perform my own road test. Before I do, though, I hook up a portable tachometer so that I'll be able to see it from the driver's seat. To do this, simply route the leads in such a way that they can't become tangled in the drive belts or rotating components. As we'll see in a minute, the tachometer can help you determine if a vibration is caused by engine components. There are five individual tests that you should perform on your road test. A constant speed test, an acceleration test, a deceleration test, a neutral coast-through test, and an engine run-up test. Take along a pencil and notepad, so you can jot down both the vehicle speed and the engine speed at which the vibration occurs. Take the vehicle out on an open stretch of smooth road, then perform a constant speed test following these steps. First, run up to a vehicle speed higher than the reported problem speed and hold this speed for 10 seconds. Here, our reported problem speed is approximately 45 miles per hour, so we're running at 55 for 10 seconds. Next, drop down to the problem speed and hold this speed for 10 seconds. After 10 seconds here, drop down to a speed below the problem speed and hold this speed for 10 seconds. Remember, when you feel the vibration, make a note of the vehicle and engine speeds at which it is most noticeable. The next test you should perform is an acceleration test. Begin accelerating well below the problem speed and run through and well beyond the problem speed. Does the vibration seem to be more severe than it was at constant speeds? If so, the problem is torque sensitive. 
That is, it shows up when torque is increasing rapidly. Next, you'll want to perform a deceleration test. But before we discuss this test, here's an important word of caution. If the vehicle is equipped with cruise control, make sure it's turned off before you begin a deceleration test. The reason for this will become apparent as we discuss this test. After you've checked your cruise control, you can conduct a deceleration test simply by taking your foot off of the accelerator and letting the vehicle coast down past the problem speed. Next, you'll want to perform this quick engine run-up test. Come to a full stop, and with the transmission in neutral, run the engine speed up to where you notice the most severe vibration during your road test. If the vibration is evident during this test, you've boiled your problem source down to the engine or engine-driven components. If this is the case, consult the technical service manual for procedures you can use to isolate the component causing the problem. Begin the neutral coast-through test by running the vehicle speed up past the problem speed. Then take your foot off of the accelerator and shift the transmission into neutral. Let the vehicle coast down by itself. You can see that if the cruise control was engaged during this test, the engine would over-rev and engine damage could result. If you find that the vibration is severe during this test, you've pretty much eliminated engine components as a cause of the vibration. In the reference booklet that accompanies this film, you'll find diagnosis charts that will help you interpret the results of your road tests. The chart shown here is the one used when tracking down mechanical vibrations on Jeep vehicles. There is a similar chart for AMC vehicles. If you determined that your vehicle is speed sensitive, torque sensitive, or engine speed sensitive, you simply look under the speed at which the problem was most severe. There, you'll find abbreviations for likely source areas, such as tire balance or U-joints. For instance, if a vehicle has a speed-sensitive problem between 20 and 50 miles per hour, the chart indicates a possible wheel-hop problem, represented by the WH. This is the chart used for locating audible vibration sources on Jeep vehicles. As you can see, this chart is used the same way. The reference booklet also contains a similar audible vibration diagnosis chart for AMC vehicles. Now let's take a look at the areas that are likely to cause vibrations and see what can go wrong in each area. Let's start with wheels and tires. Begin here by making a quick visual check for any badly worn tires. The tires shown here have been worn from various factors that can contribute to excessive wear. If you find a tire that's worn on a vehicle with vibration problems, consult the chart on tire wear that appears in the reference booklet. This chart will help you identify the cause of the tire wear. Remember, if the wear was caused by improper front-end alignment, an alignment is in order to prevent a new tire from wearing. If an alignment is needed, you can refer to the AMC film Knowing the Angles of Front Wheel Alignment. For now, though, replace the faulty tire. And make sure that each tire is inflated to the proper specifications. At this point, you'll want to check the lug nut torque on each wheel. Be sure that you tighten the nuts in the proper sequence. Out-of-spec lug nut torques can create more vibration problems than you'd think possible. You can refer to the lug nut torque charts in the reference booklet for proper specs on any AMC or Jeep vehicle. If you've made any modifications to tires or wheels at this point, road test the vehicle at the problem vehicle and engine speed to see if the vibration has been eliminated. Let's look at an area that's notorious for creating vibrations, improper wheel and tire balance. There are two types of wheel balance, static balance and dynamic balance. A wheel and tire assembly must be balanced in both categories in order to be properly balanced. Static balance refers to the distribution of the tire and wheel weight around the spindle. On a properly balanced wheel, the weight is distributed equally around the spindle. Most wheels that are out of balance are statically unbalanced. Here's a tire that's statically unbalanced due to a heavy spot. This kind of spot can produce a bounding motion which creates a thumping noise. This is often referred to as wheel hop or wheel tramp. 
This unbalanced situation can be corrected by adding a sufficient amount of weight 180 degrees from the heavy spot. As shown here, half of the weight must be added to the inside of the wheel and half to the outside of the wheel. Dynamic balance, on the other hand, refers to the balance between the inside and outside halves of the tire. Here's a tire with a heavy spot on the inside of the tire. If not compensated for, this heavy spot can have a strange effect on the tire. When the heavy spot is at the bottom of the tire's rotation, as it is on the left here, centrifugal force forces the bottom of the tire outward. But when the heavy spot reaches the top of the tire's rotation, as shown here on the right, the centrifugal force tends to force the top of the tire out, away from the car. In other words, the heavy spot tries to get to the center of the tire. As you can see then, the tire will actually be wobbling back and forth as the vehicle travels down the road. To correct this dynamic unbalanced situation, weight must be added. This is done by dividing the required weight in half and placing the two halves on opposite sides of the wheel 180 degrees apart. The most efficient wheel balancing method is computer balancing. These electronic units facilitate accurate static and dynamic balancing. Computer balancers also require less operator effort and time than other balancing devices. On-vehicle balancing has been popular due to the availability of reasonably priced, efficient equipment. The advantage here is that the tire, wheel, and brake drum can be balanced together. To maintain this balance condition, the wheels must be installed in the exact same positions if they are removed for any reason. Never exceed a 35 mile per hour speedometer reading when balancing rear wheels with only one wheel off of the floor. A 35 mile per hour speedometer reading means that the spinning wheel is rotating at 70 miles per hour. With no load on the engine, it's possible to obtain tire rotational speeds sufficient to cause violent tire failure and create a hazardous situation. Because balancing procedures vary from vehicle to vehicle, always check the technical service manual for the correct procedure. Some wheel covers have cast ornamentation, and these additional masses can, in some cases, cause an unbalanced condition. If you suspect this problem, simply balance the wheel without the cover, install the cover, and recheck the balance. You might have to add additional weight. Another possible source of vibration is excessive wheel and tire runout. There are two kinds of runout. On the left is a tire with excessive lateral runout, which is inside to outside movement. The tire on the right has excessive radial runout, which means that the tire is out of round. Here's an important item to mention. Before you check wheel and tire runout, Always drive the vehicle at least seven miles to remove any temporary flat spots that may have formed in the tires. Okay, now you can check runout using a runout gauge. To check lateral tire runout, lift the wheel off of the floor and place the gauge against the tire just above the buffing rib. Then rotate the tire by hand. The reference booklet that accompanies this film contains runout specs for lateral and radial runout on Jeep and AMC vehicles. To measure radial tire runout, place the runout gauge against the center of the tread face. Spin the tire and check the runout. Repeat this process with the gauge against the outside ribs of the tread face. If you find that the tire lateral or radial measurement exceeds the tolerance, you can perform the tests shown here to determine if you have a bad tire or a bent rim. In the photo on the left, lateral wheel runout is being measured with a dial indicator placed against the wheel rim bead flange just inside the curved lip of the flange. On the right, radial wheel runout is being checked with a dial indicator placed against the rim just inside the wheel cover retaining clips. Again, check the reference booklet for the correct specs. The diagnostic charts might direct you to the exhaust system as a possible source. Inspect the entire system and make sure that none of the parts are contacting the underbody or frame. 
Let's take a minute to look at the U-joints used on Jeep and AMC vehicles. The single carton U-joint is used for most applications. The double carton U-joint is also used for some applications. The double carton U-joint is also referred to as a constant velocity or CV joint. You'll also find a ball and trunnion U-joint on some vehicles. This unit functions as a U-joint and a slip yoke. Let's run through the procedures you can use to isolate and correct prop shaft and U-joint vibration problems. If your vehicle is a four-wheel drive Jeep, begin by removing the rear prop shaft. Be sure to index mark the shaft and yokes first. Then, test drive the vehicle. Be sure to engage the emergency drive on vehicles equipped with quadra track. On conventionals, put the vehicle in four high. If the vibration is gone or considerably reduced, inspect the rear prop shaft for missing weights, excessive undercoating, and bends or dents. Also look for binding or brunelled U-joints and a binding slip yoke. If any of these conditions are present, make the necessary repairs or replacements. After you have reinstalled the prop shaft, perform another road test. If the vibration problem is gone, you've corrected the problem. If you haven't found the problem yet, check the prop shaft runout. As indicated here, you should check runout in three locations, at the front, center, and rear of the shaft. Be sure to clean each area with sandpaper. With the vehicle in neutral, you can rotate the shaft by hand. The correct specifications for the three locations are contained in the reference booklet. Say, for instance, that the prop shaft has excessive runout at the rear of the shaft, as this one does. This indicates either a problem with the prop shaft or rear axle pinion yoke. To determine the cause, mark the high spot as we've done here. Re-index the shaft 180 degrees and recheck the runout. If the high spot is still on the X, you know that the prop shaft is at fault and must be replaced. But if the high spot is now opposite the X, the rear axle pinion yoke is faulty and must be replaced. This same test can be used if excessive runout is present at the front of the prop shaft. If you find excessive runout only at the center of the prop shaft, it's a pretty safe bet that the prop shaft is bent. If you haven't found the problem yet, there is another area to consider, the operating angles of the U-joints. Incorrect U-joint angles can be the source of a torque-sensitive problem. Ideally, drive lines could be designed with no U-joints at all, like the setup shown here. This design would be fine if it wasn't for one thing. In reality, the drive wheels must be free to move up and down in relation to the frame when a vehicle encounters uneven driving surfaces. This means that the line of drive must constantly change. So the required flexibility in the drive line is accomplished by the use of U-joints. Now let's see how U-joints operating angles can create vibrations. In a single carton U-joint, shown here, the driving yoke rotates through plane A at a constant speed. The driven member, however, rotates through plane B and actually speeds up and slows down twice during each complete revolution. You can feel this same effect when you use a universal type socket connector. I'm sure you've noticed how the angle of the universal creates uneven speeds in your wrench rotation as you remove or tighten a bolt. The more acute the angle, the more you feel this effect. You can see how this principle applies to U-joint angles. If the angles are incorrect, driveline vibrations can occur. As shown here, Jeep and AMC drivelines are designed to incorporate positive universal joint angles on rear drivelines. The angles here are exaggerated for explanatory purposes. Notice that both the engine and the pinion are at downward angles in relation to the prop shaft center line. Here's the reason for these built-in angles. When a vehicle is driven, load factors, drive torque, and other forces tend to straighten the drive line out, as shown here. The nose of the pinion actually rises, and the angles are eliminated. So you can see why the positive U-joint angles must be designed into the drive line. If they weren't, 
This is what the drive line would look like when the vehicle is driven. The rising engine and pinion nose would bend the drive line into this type of configuration, and vibrations would be the result. It's critical that the correct positive angles are maintained. If they aren't, they could be causing the vibration you're looking for. Here's how you can measure rear U-joint angles on Jeep and AMC vehicles. With the vehicle on a drive-on hoist, install the inclinometer tool on the transfer case slip yoke bearing cap, as shown on the left. Record this measurement. Next, install the inclinometer on the prop shaft yoke bearing cap. Subtract this measurement from your first measurement, and this gives you your front universal joint angle. Now take a reading with the inclinometer installed on the rear axle yoke bearing cap. Take a reading with a tool attached to the rear prop shaft yoke bearing cap. The difference between the two is your rear universal joint angle. For AMC vehicles, check the specs in the film reference booklet to see if your angles are correct. For Jeep vehicles, consult the technical service manual. If they aren't correct, check for worn motor mounts or air shocks. These factors can definitely affect U-joint angles. If you do need to correct the angle, shims are available for this purpose. On vehicles with leaf springs, the shims are placed between the spring and the rear axle tube spring pad. On vehicles equipped with coil springs, the shims are placed between the rear suspension cross member and the mounting bracket. Consult the technical service manual for complete shimming procedures. If you still haven't found the cause of the problem, inspect the front prop shaft for the possible conditions we discussed earlier. Make any necessary repairs or replacements. Road test the vehicle to see if you've eliminated the vibration. If necessary, check the runout of the front prop shaft using the same procedure that we covered for the rear. Replace the faulty prop shaft or the yoke if this is the problem and road test the vehicle. If you haven't located the problem yet, check the operating angles of the front U-joints. On the front, a negative U-joint angle is incorporated into the design. Note that the front pinion has an upward angle versus the rear pinion's downward angle. Here's the reason for the design difference. When the vehicle is being driven, the load factors, drive torque and other forces, tend to straighten the front drive line as shown here. The nose of the pinion drops and a straight drive line is formed. The front pinion U-joint angle does not have to be compared to engine angle. Simply place the inclinometer on the front axle yoke bearing cap. Record the reading. Then take a reading with the inclinometer on the front prop shaft yoke bearing cap. Subtract this measurement from the first, and you have front U-joint angle. Consult the specs contained in the reference booklet to see if shimming is required. Well, that completes our look at procedures for diagnosing and eliminating vehicle vibrations. I hope I've helped you understand vibrations a little better. By using a systematic approach, I think you'll find that vibration jobs go a lot quicker. Remember that the customer can be a big help if the service advisor asks the right questions. And a few quick tests can also help you get to the source of the problem. The handy reference booklet that accompanies this film contains highlights from the film and also the various specifications for possible vibration problem areas. You can see from the ground we've covered in this film that vibration diagnosis and correction procedures are similar for both Jeep and AMC vehicles. Remember, though, that the technical service manuals provide complete procedures for the individual vehicles in each line.